Hey everyone, I'm James. Last year, I watched some Summer of Math exposition videos, and I really enjoyed them. So this year, I'm going to make one myself. One of the videos from last year that caught my attention was the best way to find a random point in a circle by Justin. Coincidentally, two of the courses that I took at university this year mentioned higher dimensional volumes and geometry. So in this video, I'm going to extend Justin's results and talk about how to find a uniform random point in a high dimensional ball. As you will see, the results in higher dimensions are quite different from those in two dimensions. The first method that Justin mentioned in his video was rejection sampling. The idea of rejection sampling is that we select a random point from a square, where each coordinate is selected uniformly at random between negative 1 and 1. If the point selected happen to be in the unit circle, we're done. If not, we reject that point and select another one. This generalizes easily to n dimensions, so I'm going to implement it. Here's my code. The code first enters an infinite loop so we can repeat the selection process until we get a valid point. For each trial, we generate an array with n entries and initialize each entry with a uniform random number between negative 1 and 1. Since the dot product of a vector with itself is the square of its length, we can use the dot function of numpy to check whether the point is in the ball. And if it is, we return the point. Notice that we also track the number of trials it takes to get a valid point and we return it along with the vector. I selected 3,141 points for dimensions 1 to 14 and recorded the average number of trials. Here are the results. As you can see, as the dimension increases, the number of trials increases very rapidly. In just 14 dimensions, each point on average already requires more than 10,000 trials. We can imagine that in higher dimensions, it takes even more trials to get a valid point. Even when we switch to log scale for the number of trials, the graph still appears to be concave up. This indicates that the number of trials may grow faster than exponentially with dimension. How did that happen? Let x be the number of trials that we need to select a valid point in the ball. Since each trial is independent, and we repeat until we succeed, x is a geometric random variable. Let beta n be the n-dimensional volume of the n-dimensional unit ball. Let kappa n be the volume of the n-dimensional box that we sample from, where kappa stands for cube. Since each component is randomly selected between negative 1 and 1, the box has side length 2, so its n-dimensional volume is 2 to the n. For any particular trial, the probability that the point we selected is in the ball is equal to the ratio between the volume of the ball and the volume of the box. Therefore, to find this probability, we need to find beta n, the volume of the n-dimensional unit ball. We will set up an integral to figure out beta n. First, we divide the ball into small slices where each slice is approximately a small cylinder. We vary the x1 coordinate from negative 1 to 1 and add up the volumes of these small cylinders. The height of each cylinder is dx1. The base is an n-1 dimensional ball. In the special case of three dimensions, the base of each slice is a circle. Since the radius of the n-dimensional ball is 1 and this side has length x1, the radius of the base is r equals the square root of 1 minus x1 squared by the Pythagorean theorem. Since volume scales appropriately according to dimension, the n minus 1 dimensional volume of the base is r to the n minus 1 times beta n minus 1, where beta n minus 1 is the volume of the n minus 1 dimensional unit ball. Thus, the n dimensional volume of this small slice is base times height, or dv, equals r to the n minus 1, beta n minus 1, dx1. Setting up the integral, we have beta n equals the integral of dv, which is this integral over here. Now we pull out beta n minus 1 from the integral because it's just a constant. It remains to figure out this integral, which I denote by cn, because then we have the recurrence relation beta n equals cn times beta n minus 1. Now we use some trick substitution, And now we use some integration by parts. 
The first term on the right-hand side is 0, so we get this expression for Cn. And now we use some trick identities and rearranging, and we get this beautiful recurrence relation, which is Cn equals m minus 1 over n times Cn minus 2. The base cases for Cn are C1 equals 2 and C2 equals pi over 2. Recall that beta n is equal to Cn beta m minus 1. If we go from m minus 1 dimensions to n dimensions, kappa will increase by a factor of 2, whereas beta will be multiplied by a factor of cn. Therefore, the ratio between beta and kappa gets multiplied by a factor of cn over 2 each time we raise a dimension. If cn were a constant that is less than 2, say 1.5, then every time we raise a dimension, the ratio beta n over kappa n will decrease by a factor of 3 quarters. Since the probability that a particular trial succeeds is equal to that ratio, the probability will decay exponentially by a factor of 3 quarters each time. However, in reality, cn is equal to m minus 1 over n cn minus 2. And since the factor m minus 1 over n is less than 1, this means that the multiplier cn is not a constant, it decreases every time. Therefore, the ratio and thus the probability decays faster than exponentially. Since the expected value of a geometric p random variable is 1 over p, this implies that the expected number of trials needed to sample a valid point increases faster than exponentially. Another method to select a random point from a circle that Justin mentioned was to turn to polar coordinates. We first choose theta uniformly, then choose r so that the points r theta are distributed uniformly in the circle. We can try to apply this idea to higher dimensions. In three dimensions, we can try to choose r, theta, and phi in some way such that the points represented by r theta phi in spherical coordinates are distributed uniformly in a three-dimensional ball. However, we can't choose phi uniformly, because when phi is close to pi over 2, that is, we're choosing points near the equator, we expect to see way more points than when phi is close to 0 or pi, or near the poles. There are high-dimensional analogs of the spherical coordinates in higher dimensions, but we can imagine that as the dimensions go up, it would be increasingly difficult to keep track of the distributions of each variable. Instead, we take a similar approach. First choose a direction uniformly at random, and then choose a random number between 0 and 1 to be the distance from the origin. Choosing a random direction in n-dimensional space is the same as choosing a random point on the n-dimensional unisphere. A sphere is the boundary of a ball, and points on the unisphere satisfy x1 squared plus x2 squared all the way to xn squared equals 1. So now, our task is divided into two parts, choosing a random point on the unisphere and choosing a distance from the origin. We'll focus on the first part for now and worry about choosing a distance later. To select a random point on a sphere, we might try the following method. We choose a random vector from a box with side length 2 where each component is chosen uniformly from negative 1 to 1. Then, we normalize this vector by dividing away its length. The resulting vector is a unit vector, so it lies on the unit sphere. This seems like a good approach, but after some thought, we can see that the random points generated in this way aren't distributed uniformly on the sphere. Intuitively, it's more likely to choose a point near the diagonals of the box then near the center of the faces. Let's look at a two-dimensional example. The distance from the origin to the upper right corner is square root of 2, whereas the distance from the origin to the upper edge is 1. Consider these two cones, which are just triangles in 2D. If a random vector falls into the green cone, it will be scaled to a point on this green arc. If a random vector falls into the blue cone, it will be scaled to a point on this blue arc. The cones are drawn such that the blue and the green arcs have the same length. Then these two cones are similar, and the ratio between their areas is square root of 2 over 1 squared. For n dimensions, 
the diagonal distance will be square root of n times larger, and the ratio between the volumes of the cones will be square root of n over 1 to the nth power. This again grows faster than exponentially, which means that the probability that a random point lands on one region of the sphere is more than exponentially bigger than the probability that a random point lands on some other region of the sphere with the same area. The problem with the box is that it is not rotationally invariant. If we rotate the box by a certain amount, the rotated box does not look the same as the original. Meanwhile, the ball and the sphere are all rotationally invariant. However we rotate them, they look the same. Every rotation in Rn can be characterized by an orthogonal matrix. An orthogonal matrix is a matrix whose columns and rows form an orthonormal basis. For instance, in R2, we can express a rotation like this. The columns, cosine theta, sine theta, and negative sine theta, cosine theta, are orthonormal because the length of both vectors are 1, and the dot product between the two vectors is 0. Similarly, the rows of Q are also orthonormal. To figure out a valid way to choose a point uniformly on the sphere, we need to think outside the box, literally, introducing the multivariate normal distribution. As you might know, the probability density function of a normal random variable is shaped like a bell curve. Here, we're using the standard multivariate normal distribution, which is a vector of independent random variables, each of which follows the standard normal distribution. You might also know that any linear combination of independent normal random variables is still a normal random variable. We can use this fact to show that the standard multivariate normal distribution is rotationally invariant. Suppose Q is the orthogonal matrix representing an arbitrary rotation in Rn, and X is a standard multivariate normal. Then each Xi is a Gaussian with mean 0 and variance 1. The first element of y equals qx is y1 equals q11 x1 plus q12 x2 all the way to q1n xn. Since q is orthogonal, q11 squared plus q12 squared all the way to q1n squared equals 1. Since the xi's are independent Gaussian random variables, the linear combination is still a Gaussian random variable. Moreover, by linearity of expectation, the mean of y1 is 0, and by independence, the variance of y1 is 1. We have shown that y1 is a standard normal random variable. This is the same for each component of y equals qx. A quick calculation of covariance shows that the components of y are independent, so y is still a standard multivariate normal. Thus, x is rotationally invariant. Here's a graph of the joint density function of a two-dimensional standard multivariate normal random variable. We can see from the density function that the distribution is indeed symmetric around the origin. Now, we can first generate a random vector that follows the multivariate normal distribution and normalize it, and it will give a point on the unit sphere selected uniformly at random. To see why it's uniform, choose two different small patches on the sphere, A and B, that are congruent to each other. Suppose that P is the probability that a random unit vector falls in A. Then, we can rotate a sphere so that A coincides with B. Thus, the probability that a random vector falls in B after the rotation is P. Because the multivariate normal distribution is rotationally invariant, the distribution of points after the rotation is the same as the distribution before the rotation, so the probability that a random unit vector falls in A after the rotation is also P. Since every region on the sphere can be considered as being made up by these small patches, the probability that a chosen point falls inside that region is proportional to the area of the region. There is still the problem of how to generate a Gaussian random variable from a uniform random variable since the CDF of a Gaussian random variable does not have a closed elementary form. This is a good topic for a separate video, and I'm just going to rely on the Python library to do this. But for those who are interested, 
there's an algorithm called the box molar transform which can do that. The key feature of that algorithm is that it runs in polynomial time. After finding a uniform random point on the sphere, it is now time to choose the distance from the origin. Here, we use the same method as Justin used in his video. Let x be the random variable that denotes the distance from the origin. We first find the cumulative distribution function f sub x, where f x of r is the probability that x is less than or equal to r. The set of all points with distance to the origin less than or equal to r form a ball of radius r. The probability that x is less than or equal to r is thus the ratio between the volume of a ball of radius r and that of the unit ball. Since volumes scale appropriately according to dimension, that ratio is r to the n. Thus, fx of r is r to the n. Notice that for a given r between 0 and 1, as n increases, the probability that x is less than or equal to r gets smaller and smaller. This implies that as n increases, most of the volume of the ball concentrates near the surface of the ball. For instance, when n is equal to 500, the probability that a random point in the unit ball is at least 0.99 units away from the origin is approximately 99.3%. Now we shall use the inverse transform sampling technique that Justin mentioned. If u is a uniform random variable, then x has the same distribution as fx inverse of u. In our case, we have x is equal to the nth root of u. Here's my Python code that generates random points in the unit ball using this process. To choose a random unit vector, we first create a vector whose components are sample from the standard normal distribution. Then we normalize the vector. To find a uniform random point in the ball, we take that random unit vector and scale it by the nth root of a uniform random number between 0 and 1. Even when n is big, the program still finds random points in an n-dimensional unit ball very quickly, much more quickly than rejection sampling. Unfortunately, I cannot plot higher dimensional points in our 3D world. So here's a demonstration of this algorithm in two and three dimensions. To recap, we first try to use rejection sampling to select random points in the unit ball. However, after a simulation, in a calculation of the volume of an n-dimensional ball, we discover that the number of trials needed to get a valid point increases faster than exponentially as dimension increases. We then tried to use spherical coordinates, but decided that it was too difficult to determine the distribution of each variable. Instead, we turn to the method of selecting a random direction and a random distance. The first task is equivalent to selecting a uniform random point on a sphere. We try to select points in the box and then normalize them, but that did not result in a uniform distribution. To tackle this problem, we had to think outside the box and use a distribution that is rotationally invariant, the standard multivariate normal distribution. The second task generalizes easily from the two-dimensional case. We calculated the CDF of the distance from the origin and then use inverse transform sampling. I personally find the topic of higher dimensional geometry very intriguing because many results in higher dimensions are surprising and counterintuitive. I was amazed when I first learned how quickly the volume of the ball decays relative to the box that surrounds it. On the other hand, Making this video is a rewarding experience for me. Although I learned about this material in class, I had to organize the key points so I can explain them to you in a relatively short video. In addition, I took up the challenge to teach myself Manon. I was very impressed by the neat style and the cool animations in the 3 Boo one Browns videos, along with the excellent explanations, so I was determined to learn to use Manon. Despite being only a beginner of this tool, I already feel the power of abstraction compared to simply using PowerPoint slides. I hope this was a pleasant journey, and I hope to see you again in next year's Summer of Math Exposition.